And welcome to Crux Investor. We got up earlier today with Trey Vasa, he's the CEO at Ely Gold Royalties, a Nevada focused royalty company. We've also got a property option portfolio in there too. We get an update on the cash position uh, and the cash flow uh, going forward. He also talks about some of the properties Warbridge, I think people have asked us to um, talk to him about. Um, and we do that. So if you want to get our thoughts and opinions, on the conversation, you can find that at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club. We can also find detailed company reports and analysis. Uh, there's commentary from experts from around the world on a variety of companies and commodities and royalties uh, too uh, on our weekly shows. Uh, plus there are training courses to help you with diligence process. We do summaries of interviews just to save you some time because we know you're busy. And if you want to join a thriving community of investors sharing their thoughts and ideas with each other in a nice, safe and friendly environment, free from abuse, judgment, and trolling, you can go and join at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club. Hope you think that sounds nice. And we'd love your feedback too. So uh, do give us a like if you appreciate it. Uh, leave your comments below, we'll get back to everyone. And if you want to see precisely what we talked about today with Trey, take a look in the description below. Trey, how are you, sir? Very good, how are you? I am surviving, I'm surviving. How's Texas? We're hearing all sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> Texas is great, we're ready to secede. Right. Okay, but everything's opening up, right? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've been open here in Texas, and uh, you know the, uh, the the big issue here now is the governor has come out and said we don't have to wear masks, and uh, so people are fighting in the stores over whether or not they should wear masks. I don't know if you saw the video of the poor woman getting poor seventy year old woman being tackled because she refused to put her mask on in the grocery store. No, I missed that. But uh, uh, crazy times. Crazy times indeed. Well, um, leading from the front, as Texas always does, right? So, mm. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the, the world didn't really understand how independent Texas really is and can be until we had that uh, deep freeze here a few weeks ago and, uh, and, and, and realized that, uh, you know, there's three power grids in the United States, one for the East Coast, one for the West Coast, and one for Texas. Um, so we heard. It, how, uh, how, how did that work out? Uh, it worked out fine for us. I mean, we weren't affected too bad. I, I was able to leave my apartment and go to my girlfriend's and she was near a hospital or either a hospital or a WITSEC, uh, uh, a high level WITSEC uh, uh, witness that uh, which is the witness protection program. Yeah, that's anyway, somebody complained that a judge's mother must have lived in the neighborhood uh, because her power never went out. There we go. You heard it here first, folks. Well, we, we better um, talk about all things royalty. That's the whole point of this week. So why don't you kick off, give everyone a one minute uh, overview just to remind them of what it is that uh, ED Gold Royalties is, and I'll pick it up from there. All right. Yeah. Ely Gold Royalties is a uh, junior royalty company. We are focused in Nevada and uh, with secondary focus in Canada. So we stay in very safe jurisdictions. Uh, we uh, both purchase royalties and we generate royalties through an extensive program of, of acquiring properties, selling those properties and, and retaining royalties. So uh, we've got a very robust portfolio right now, over 100 projects, 100 either either properties that are being optioned out or uh, or royalties. And uh, so it really puts us in a in a league with some of the more mid tier royalty companies, uh, but, uh, you know, at at a discounted price at this point. So can you break that down for me? So how, how many are yours that you're generating options for and how many have you actually bought? Well, uh, it, 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 it's overall kind of a mix. I don't even know that I can bring it down. Right now, we have we break our assets down into three categories. Our key assets, and of those, they've all been purchased. Those are royalties that are either currently producing or will be producing by 2024, 2025. Uh, we then have our development assets, of which we have about... 35. Now, those uh, have been created either by through purchase and our royalty, or they are uh, in our option plan being purchased, uh, or they're leased uh, with a, uh, we've picked up some, some properties through 
uh, that, would, that have legacy leases on them that would include an NSR or royalty. Uh, so, and then, and then we have about uh, uh, 40 properties in what we call our exploration portfolio. And these are the ones that are being explored by juniors. Primarily, I'd say the, those are about uh, 60, 70% are in the option program, uh, the option portfolio. And um, so those are the longer term, the development assets by design are, uh, they, by, or by definition, have to be assets that are at or near producing mines or, 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 or part of a, uh, uh, a deposit, a, a project that is in the permitting phase for development. And then, of course, the key assets are either producing or going to be producing by 24, 25. Right. I'll come back to those three categories in a second. Um, but I start with the macro, because since July last year, you've come down from highs of two bucks down to 92 cents. And even since we spoke in mid-October, you're down 25%. What's happening in the market? Well, that market, I mean, it, it has been very difficult. Of course, the gold price peaked at uh, just under 2100, about the, uh, almost the same time as, as our stock peaked. Um, you know, last year was definitely a transition year for us. We made some very exciting acquisitions early in the year uh, with the Jarrett Canyon acquisition in February uh, and then the VEK transaction, which gave us the REN and uh, Marigold uh, royalties in, <clears throat> uh, in April. And meanwhile, last year was a big year for uh, a wall bridge at Fenelon. Uh, with some just very exciting results and, you know, and the, and the realization in the market that this was going to be a, a, a tier one mine. And uh, so if things have, have quieted down since then, uh, no question, uh, uh, it, uh, as, as prices went up and as a lot of new entrants came into the royalty space, it's made it much more competitive and, uh, and, and difficult to find uh, the kind of uh, uh, bargains, if you will, uh, that that, uh, that that we like to purchase. Okay, well, let's talk about what what a bargain looks like for you, because it's clearly affected your ability to do business. No big transactions have happened since, and I guess the cost of money just got a little bit more expensive in terms of using stock to 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 buy. So, how do you think it's affected you? Well, look, as a growth uh, company, and and we. Uh, of course, did a very successful uh, private placement last year. So we have about seven, between seven and eight million dollars cash. Uh, we have a line, undrawn line of credit for six million dollars. So we do have capital to to make a royalty purchases. But if we use that capital, we've got to replace it. So we have to be cognizant of our uh, the how the market is valuing our our current assets because we do think we have some of the best assets of any junior royalty company. Uh, you know, our key assets are um, mainly in Nevada, uh, which is Fenelon. Uh, nine of them are at mines that are already producing. 10 of them are with operators that are already operating mines. And some of the largest, the largest and, and, and best uh, operators in Nevada. And some of large, uh, Nevada's largest gold mines. So when you have a portfolio, portfolio like that and our stock comes off, eh, along with everyone else's, by the way, it's been a rough six months. And if you look at our chart compared to even the major royalty companies or uh, a Barrett Gold, uh, in any, any of the major gold stocks, our charts look very similar. We've probably come down a little bit more, but, uh, but very similar. Most of those major companies are off 50% from their highs. Uh, so today we trade at a net asset value per share. Our net asset value per share, let me say, is around $1.15, and we're trading at $0.92. Um, and so we want to always be cognizant of what we're paying for a royalty. In other words, we don't want to overpay or pay over our net asset value per share, uh, and we really don't want to pay over the discount that we're trading at. So 
we're trading at 75% of our net asset value. We don't want to go out and pay one and a half to two times net asset value for a, for a new royalty uh, because all it does is dilute our current assets. For some of our competitors, that's probably the right thing to do because they don't have as good of assets as we do. But with the quality of our portfolio uh, and what it's going to happen to it with just organically and with nothing done on our part over the next uh, three to five years, um, you know, we don't want to dilute that, that future. Um, and so that's made it a, a bit more challenging for us to uh, go out there and, and, and purchase and compete. There's so much competition in the, uh, in the royalty space today that everything is a process. You know, you, everyone's going out and putting, has to, you have to put in bids for the royalties. And uh, it, it's just got, got more difficult. And you're seeing a lot more competition as well. And they have different approaches and different uh, ways of valuing properties. And perhaps they don't mind overpaying occasionally. Does that make life more difficult for you? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, basically, that's, uh, that, that's just the point I was trying to make is that uh, you know, some of our competitors in the junior space, they'll pay one and a half to two times net asset value when they are trading at one times net asset value. Well, what that means is that, uh, you know, if they do that on a continual basis, pretty soon their net asset value is going to drop from, uh, you know, a, a, a dollar fifty a share to a dollar a share to 75 cents a share of net asset value because they're, they're actually diluting their current assets. Well, if you've got average to, or crappy assets and you can buy overpay, you know, pay, pay up and buy better assets. Maybe that's you are supposed to dilute uh, uh, for the future. But when you have assets, the quality of ours, the idea of, of diluting with lower quality assets than we have, uh, we think that's like blowing our brains out. Uh, we, we just have too good of assets to uh, be going out and, and diluting uh, the value per share. Okay, so let's come back to the key assets that you mentioned. You, you, you described it as being uh, key assets are those royalties which are in production or will be in production by 2024-2025. How many of those assets today have an NI43-101 on them? I think there's maybe one that doesn't. One that doesn't. Uh, one that doesn't, yeah. Uh, not, not, and that's because that, that would be the rawhide, and that's because that's a... Uh, a private company. Um, well, I'll take that back. The Isabella Pearl does not because Gold Resource typically has not filed uh, their U.S. company, so they don't file 43-101s. They, but there is legitimate engineering reports on that asset, to, um, just not an I-43-101. Okay. So how, how many do you think of those will therefore be in production in the next couple of years? Well, our profile, if we uh, look at it, and I, I'm going to cheat here and uh, just uh, uh, tell you, okay, so we have four that they're producing. That would be Isabella Pearl, our two royalties on Jarrett Canyon, which was just purchased by First Majestic, and uh, Rawhide. And then next year, 2022, we're looking at production from Marigold, uh, which is one of the key assets for SSR mining in our opinion, one of the best miners in, in Nevada. Uh, in 2023, we will see our Lincoln Hill asset come into production. That's with Core Mining, and that's at their Rochester mine. Uh, 2024, we should see Railroad, uh, Gold Standard Ventures asset, and uh, Gold, Gold Rock, uh, the Fiori Gold project, and possibly our Hog Ranch come into production. Um, so that'll be followed by uh, 2024 REN uh, come into production, which is the large, uh, our, one of our key assets, our, our largest uh, tier one asset with uh, Nevada Gold Mines, the, the Barrick Newmont joint venture. And then followed with the, in 2025, the Fenelon uh, Wallbridge asset. Right. So we have a great growth pro profile. And if you 
if you put that on the revenue and, and you know encourage your listeners to maybe go to the website and, and pull up the presentation and see it's a it makes for a very impressive uh, a revenue growth profile for us of you know about uh, uh, com- oh, combined uh, with our um, uh, option uh, income or option revenue about we should we should do right around eight million this year uh, growing to just about 10 million neck in 2022. Uh, 13 million in 2023, uh, 17 million in 2024, and then 2025 with the real with Fenelon kicking in and re- and Ren, uh, we could we could see you know they those two could add another 10 to 12 million just between those two assets. So when you have a growth profile like that, again with the with the kind of operators and the assets that we have, uh, the that it, it just doesn't make sense to go diluting that uh, to get a little bit more revenue today. Right. So on, so the eight million this year, you're expecting eight million cash in this year. And eight million, million revenue. Revenue. Right. Okay. And then ten million in 2022 accident. So what does that equate to in terms of um, gold equivalent answers? Yeah. Uh, as a, um, in terms of royalty linked reserves or, or resource, how have you got the number? Uh, that I, I, you're looking at 2022, right around uh, 2,500 gold, gold ounce equivalents on the royalty side. Remembering that we do two to three million dollars in revenue a year from that property option portfolio, uh, and. Um, and then that should grow uh, to about 4,000 or between 3,500 and 4,000 uh, ounces in 2023, uh, up to about 5,000 in, in 2024. And then when Renalon, uh, or Fenelon and Ren kick in in 2025, uh, that, that could uh, grow another five to up, up to about 10,000. Do you think that, have you got any concerns with regards to the current market as we've just described and the ability of some of these companies to get the financing that they need to be able to get into production? Well, again, <laughs> that beauty of our assets, you know, when I talk in the, in, when I do the presentation about when, when people look and, and now is the time for investors to look at all of these new royalty companies that have popped up. I want to say that it's, it's been kind of like whack-a-moles here. Uh, and, um, and, and, and now dig down and really evaluate the assets that these companies have. And, and again, I, wanna, I don't want to sound like I'm harping on this, but I, I certainly love to harp on this. Uh, we're not worried about, we don't have to worry about uh, financing. I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, let's just walk through them quickly, 12, our 12 assets. Isabella Pearl, with uh, uh, gold, gold resource now they have done that spinoff, so it's now Fortitude Gold, an operating company, uh, profitable and uh, uh, no problem with capital to expand that. Uh, and and we're looking for some exciting expansion at the Isabella Pearl, Jarrett Canyon now owned by First Majestic. Uh, we think they will really get this. We think this is a Rolls Royce asset that is in need of a. Uh, 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 to be restored and, and get it firing on all 12 cylinders. And we think Keith's uh, team will indeed do that. Uh, Rawhide is, uh, they've been operating that mine. It's a private company, Rawhide Mining LLC, but they've been operating uh, uh, since the eighties there. Walbridge Mining at, with the Fenelon, they have no problem raising money. Uh, then Lincoln Hill is with Core Mining at their number one mine, Rochester. So that's just an expansion program. Uh, no problem for them raising money. At Marigold, that's the expansion at, Mar- uh, at, uh, from SSR Mining. Again, one of the uh, larger producers and, and I think a, a large, large cash position. And then Ren with Nevada Gold Mines. I, I don't think we have to worry about them. Uh, having capital. Um, Hog Ranch with Rex Minerals, that's probably our our weakest link in there. 
uh, but I think you will probably see them upgraded through a, a, a transaction here over the next six months uh, with a producing company because it's a great asset. Gold Standard uh, with the railroad project, uh, they are fully funded by Orion who just invested 20, 30 million and committed to the full boat uh, for financing that mine construction up to $200 million. And then Gold Rock with Fiori Gold who's operating the Pan Mine has plenty of uh, capital and, and uh, cash flow from, so we're, this is what I mean when I talk about uh, that path, that path to production. I mean, we're not, we, nine of our assets, the mines are already built. They don't even have to be built. Uh, uh, 10 of them are with operators that are, uh, you know, uh, that are, that are our operators and have cash flow. Uh, uh, well, I say, uh, yeah. And then, uh, then you have Wallbridge, uh, who's uh, really they've done the operation there too. But uh, but but it'd be Wallbridge and and Rex Minerals are the only two that uh, that would ever need finance. Okay, if you look at something like Jarrett Canyon, for instance, it's gone from private to public hands. I mean, you obviously know a little bit about it, but can you tell us about the the, the terms under that deal? Has anything changed for you? Yeah, in fact, I'm I'm putting out a. Uh, it, it's kind of gotten mixed reviews because uh, you know we've been involved with uh, with Jarrett Canyon uh, since 2019 when we bought the per ton royalty. This was when we uh, were really were first getting to know Eric Sprott, who uh, owned that asset. He bought that out of bankruptcy from Varus in in the Varus bankruptcy in 2015. This is an asset that has been in weak hands since the early 90s. Uh, give you a bit of history on it. Uh, in uh, Anglo Gold had it and we're built it and we're operating it. Uh, I believe they built it, uh, uh, but uh, anyway, they had it. They did an extensive uh, exploration program in the early 90s because this is a 119 square mile land package and it's some of the best underexplored Carlin style real estate in Nevada. Um, and uh, they did a, a, a district-wide uh, exploration program where they tested uh, over a dozen targets and came up with some very interesting results, one ounce intercepts. And uh, subsequently, at just a year later after that two-year program ended, they sold to FMC. FMC just milked the thing never did any expiration. Uh, then uh, it went to Queen Steak, who ran it into the, you know, had problems with it, uh, with the, uh, with the scrubber at the, at the, uh, uh, with the, uh, and, and it was uh, with the mercury. And, um, and then Barris got it. They also had some mercury emission problems and, and ended up going bankrupt. And of course, these were in tougher times, right? To uh, the, with the gold price. So, um, the uh, in fact, the per ton royalty that we have is on the uh, uh, the uh, patent from the man who solved the mercury problem there. And uh, <clears throat> so, Eric got that in 2015. He started uh, operating it and, and getting it back on its legs. He put some money into it. Uh, the most important things they did, he brought, they, he brought in a really good operator, a man named Rod Lamont. And, uh, uh, you know, he did some things. He shut down the lower grade mine uh, at, at Starvation Canyon. He uh, focused on, on underground exploration and expanding the higher grade SX steer that was right there at the, at near the mill. Um, and really was getting that thing on its uh, turned around or got it turned around. And then Rod died suddenly here about a year, year uh, 18 months ago. And uh, so uh, since then, Eric's, you know, he's had some good operators, but nobody with a, with a great vision on it. So uh, you, you have it. Uh, uh, first of all, this is the only mill left in Nevada, not owned by Newmont and, and Barrick, Nevada gold mines. Uh, that can handle refractory ore. Uh, it uh, is operating at about half a capacity. 
uh, the, the mill there is able to do 4,000 to 4,500 tons a day. It's operating at about 2,200 tons a day. Uh, it's profitable at that level. Uh, the all-in sustaining costs are around uh, 12, 1250. Uh, I want to say it's a bit nebulous because obviously it's a private company. But uh, the, the uh, um, you, you know one of the key things that Eric did. Well, let me back up. So first of all, the fact that any mill that can operate at 50% capacity and uh, still have that all-in sustaining cost that low, although it, it sounds high, but for a, for a mill that's operating at 50% capacity, uh, it shows you what, uh, uh, how, how nice that could look at, uh, at, at 90% to, to 100% capacity. Now, one of the major things Eric did was put in a water treatment plant because we did a 43101 on that and we have, there's a, we showed about 2 million ounces. And a million of that ounces approximately are in the old high grade portion of the mine uh, below the water table. Uh, currently they're mining five to six gram material. This is eight to nine gram material and it's right under the old working. So not hard to develop once you get the pumps in and start pumping. They weren't able for, you know, for environmental reasons to pump that uh, uh, water because the sulfites and stuff uh, at, uh, uh, but, uh, and so now that they're setting that up to pump and to be able to go back in and mine that eight to nine gram material. And uh, I think, uh, and, and I'm sure you'll see Keith come in with a, uh, with a uh, exploration program and follow up on some of that old Anglo drilling. Uh, and he gets that up to 4,000 tons a day and some high, you know, doing six, seven gram material on average. Uh, I think you will, uh, you know, you'll see that thing do 200,000. They did 112,000 ounces last year. Uh, uh, we made over a million dollars in uh, about 1.2 million uh, in a partial year on that royalty. And uh, we think, we think that First Majestic, with their expertise underground and to prove to the market that this is going to be their flagship asset in, uh, uh, in Nevada now as they kind of transition away from Mexico, uh, we, we love that asset. And, and we think, we think uh, First Majestic made a very smart move and, and that 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 mine will operate for, it's been operating for 40 years. Uh, I, I think it could operate for another 40 uh, with that land package. Did your terms change at all with First Majestic coming in or did you manage to keep that the same? No, not at all. Uh, in fact, I mean, we, like I said, we, we think as they increase, obviously uh, uh, we, we think that thing has the potential to ultimately, you know, be a, uh, the NSR uh, uh, two and a half to 3 million uh, dollar a year uh, asset for us on the NSR on the per ton royalty. You know, of course, that's interesting because that's paid on every every uh, on the on the tonnage that goes through the mill on monthly basis. Uh, so we get a report every month of of how much they've done, and and uh, they get that up to doing four thousand tons a day. We get paid currently thirty cents uh, a ton. And so that, uh, you know, right now we're making about 20 grand a month, uh, but they get a, that up to 4,000 tons a day. And, uh, um, and go, if, go, when, if gold goes to 2,000, we make 40, it go, our royalty goes up to 40 cents a ton. So at that point, we'd be making about 50 grand a month. Uh, 50 grand a month on an asset we paid 600,000 for. Uh, so... When, when, when's gold uh, going to 2000? Help me. <laughs> Are we switching gears here? <laughs> I, I just want to know. If you know something, I don't. Yeah, you, you and me both. No. Well, look, I always tell Jerry, uh, my partner, I say, look, the, the beauty of, of operating, a, you know, being the CEO of a, of a gold mining company or gold royalty company, especially, is that I, I never have to uh, tell my shareholders, uh, you know, you never see in my presentation, a slide that says why gold, you know, why copper and why oil and, you know, any other commodity, why zinc, 
you know, you have to make a case for electric vehicles and, you know, a bunch of market stuff and electric grid. And, uh, and, and look, I, I certainly believe some of those stories too, but with gold, I never have to do that. You know, our investors are, they're looking for exposure to gold. They're looking for some of the best leverage that they can get. Uh, in, in, and that's why they're looking at royalty companies and, uh, and junior royalty companies specifically. Uh, but gold goes up. Uh, shareholders are all happy. If it goes, goes down, they don't blame me because my, I sold them some uh, thesis that didn't work out. They blame Goldman Sachs or you know the wor- World Banks or, or Central Bank somewhere. And uh, so... Uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, I, I, look, I think we're in an environment here where uh, the crazy assets that are going up, I can't believe that gold's not going up along with it because everything's going up right now because there's so much liquidity out there chasing just anything. I'll ask you about Plenty that in a second. Bold. I'll ask you about it in a second. Um, but, but it's interesting, interesting that you say that you don't have to stay or you'd rather not uh, make those statements. But there are royalty companies who do feel the need to tell that story, do, do feel the need to talk about gold going to 3,000, 5,000, et cetera. And I, I just, it's interesting that you, you uh, choose not to go down that path. Um, can, we, can we talk about um, Rawhide as well, which is the other private one? So in terms of, again, data available to Joe Public trying to understand what it is that the assets are. So again, what can you tell us about Rawhide? Well, Rawhide's a little, like I said, it's a little bit more difficult, although, you know, one of our um, uh, competitors, uh, right at about the same time we bought that uh, net profit interest there, EMX royalties, put an equity position in. So they're going to be, you know, we, the, the, the Rawhide is, uh, and another company, uh, is it Ascot? Uh, I think it's Ascot, uh, also put in, uh, uh, took an equity position. And so with those two new public entities in the private, we're going to see, I think, more, more disclosure. Uh, whether or not uh, they have, I'm not sure if they're planning to put a 43-101 together, anything like that. But as a private company, they have had to do banking, uh, you know, uh, reports for the bankers and stuff. So uh, we see that stuff as a, uh, a holder of a net profit interest. Obviously, we get to uh, kind of kind of get to look at the books, but probably, you know, certainly not one of our, uh, I, I mean, I'd put that down the list uh, as far as the, uh, uh, you know, it being a net profit interest and it being uh, a more limited uh, life royalty. So uh, it, we, we should be able to give, uh, give the market more, uh, 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 more view on that coming up here this year, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's it's going to be more just the proofs in the pudding as far as when the, the when the revenues start coming in. Right. Okay. Fair, fair point to make. Um, and just uh, finally, in terms of assets, because I know there's a bunch we could go through, but I think this is spec bit of a two hour conversation. But um, Woolbridge, so they're putting out or they're they're hoping to put out their maiden resource Q3 this year. Um, is what they're aiming for. They've got to drill another 70,000 uh, 70, meters um, on on that, so it may slip to Q4, but depending on what happens with COVID restrictions, et cetera. But you, you think that's a 2025 story for you guys in terms of when it starts to benefit you on the bottom line? Uh, that's what we're looking at now. I think, you know, they, they up until January of this year, uh, you know, I was telling the story and sticking my neck out a bit. And, uh, and then uh, Walbridge started talking about it more in late last year that they had applied for a small miners permit. And the idea with the small miners permit would be they could do four to 500 uh, tons a day of mine production, which to us would have made a, over a couple million dollars of revenue. So not insignificant at the grades there. Uh, the reason they were going to do that, uh, I always felt, is that 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 first, first the problem they've had is they've found so much gold there, 
you know, every time they drill, they, they, they find more gold. So as they're stepping out and stuff. So the, the, the idea of going back in and these structures stand almost vertical. So if you think about these structures and, and even though they're very wide, uh, they're all standing vertical. So drilling them from surface is very difficult, you know, I mean, to get down below where they are now, I think they're having to get, you know, they're moving over the border from Quebec to, uh, to Ontario. Uh, and, and I say that facetiously, but it's, it's nearly true. And you just can't do that. I mean, they're down at about six or 800 meters now in this thick Tabasco and Cayenne zones with high grade, you know, 20, 30 meters wide thickness, uh, which is almost unheard of in, uh, in that part of the country or that part of the world. And so drilling those holes, you know, you're talking about 1,200 uh, to 1,400 meter uh, holes to get at an angle to go through that vertical uh, structure in any kind of place. So uh, the way that they did the development drilling on the main zone was they did a, a, uh, a pilot mining operation in two, late 2018, 2019. And they mi actually mined down, uh, put in mine infrastructure down six levels and then put a drift in. And they've been development drilling that, uh, that main zone here with like 50 to 100 meter holes. That's the ideal way to do it. And, uh, you know, so the idea was to take this small mining and mine down another six levels and get above those Tabasco and Cayenne zones and development drill them with 100 meter holes. Uh, now, I'm told that they are still going to do that. They are st still going to, um, uh, to, to and, and they can do this without permits. If they're not, they will let them develop the mine and give them, a, it's, 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 a, it's a whole different permit, but uh, it very it, much easier to get the permit to do the mine development because they'll call it exploration. Uh, but if they start taking out ore, then uh, it's, it's a different story. So I think their decision was based on, look, uh, uh, this is, we found, they found so much gold there. I think the maiden resource will, will likely be, you know, over 2 million ounces I, 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 and, and could be up to four. Just depends on how much, you know, 70,000 meters sounds like a lot of, uh, um, a lot of drilling. But again, when you're having to drill those, those deep holes from surface, it's also hard to control those holes, you know, just, you don't really know when you get to the ore body there, exactly where you are. Um, so anyway, it, uh, we're, we, we think that's going to be a great asset. It's a lo little longer term for us, but I think ultimately what they're going to look at doing is getting that maiden resource out, working towards a, uh, a mine plan and, uh, and, and the permitting for a full operation, building an on-site mill. And yeah, that's going to take four or five years to, uh, to accomplish. But uh, in the end for us, it'll mean that they'll be doing uh, <clears throat> you know, 1,500 to 2,000 tons a day anyway from the mill. And, you know, it'll be an eight to $10 million a year revenue uh, operation for us. Right. Okay. So you are being very realistic about the time frame that, that, but that interests me though, is that you can put a guesstimate on it. They can't. I, I mean, I asked him last month, I asked him, what, what are you going to come out with? And <laughs> he he can't put come up with a number because I think you get into in trouble, but you holding a royalty on it can, which helps you guys. So you got two public companies with slightly different conditions attached, right? Well, look, I, I'm, uh, I'm just throwing numbers out there, but uh, it, it, that uh, I've heard from, from different analysts and, you know, there are analysts that cover the stock that you can, that, that are making their own estimates. If you go back to last year, I can't remember, I think it was a September or something. If you go back through the Wallbridge press releases, uh, while Mars Cord, the CEO, he didn't actually give a number. What he did is he gave you all the dimensions so that you could do the math yourself. And if you do the math from what he said of that they've identified this thickness at this grade over this distance and this, 
uh, and you just do the multiplication, I mean, it comes out to two to three million ounces. Uh, now, do, you, do you think? Can I can I ask you a question? I, I, th I think they may. Yeah. Let me ask you another one because you're talking about analysts. You just mentioned analysts, right? Okay. So if you've got analysts who are starting or starting to or are covering the royalty space, and you've got two, three hundred assets in a royalty company, do you think those analysts go through each and every asset to come up with their buy sell recommendation? Well, uh, I would say from personal experience, no. Uh, what the analysts do is they uh, uh, they put a net asset value on the projects, the properties, based on the size the and the operator and um, it, it, you know the the real quality of the asset. I mean, is it something that can be developed? I mean, it's when the, you know, or, or is this a, a, a lower grade underground operation that's going to be marginal or has some metallurgical challenges or, or other things that, but for the most part, if you look at our portfolio, so uh, uh, our two analysts, Jacques Wortman from uh, uh, Laurentian and Mark Reichman from Noble, both gone through the exercise with me. I spend ultimately or ultimately hours with them going through the thing. But in our case, they put net asset value on the 12 key assets uh, because those are the ones they can wrap their head around. They can say, they can make a, uh, a, and we don't give them this. They contact the companies and everything. And they put, put you know, that date. You have to have a production start date, right? Because net, remembering net asset value is nothing more than the discounted uh, value of the, of the future revenue streams. Uh, so that, uh, you know, they, ha they have to pull a date out. Now, I've seen some analysts on some other junior companies where they just pull a date out and say, well, we think this could be then. It's not a company telling them that. It's not, uh, you know, and the, the, the likelihood of it, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you, you generally like our analyst, uh, Jacques, will increase the discount rate for his, uh, uh, his certainty or, or, you know, for, for the increased risk. So therefore, some of our, most of our assets are actually discounted at 8%. Now, this is something that drives Eric Sprott crazy because, you know, if you're a gold investor, the idea that you would discount the future revenue coming from gold is, uh, is ridiculous because you should be putting a premium on it because the price of gold is going to be higher then. Uh, <laughs> but that's not how it, that's not how it works. Uh, but if you think about it, it's, it's not a, it, it's a, it's fair argument. One, Eric and I have had you know, um, uh, several times or dis discussion, I shouldn't say argument, but anyway, so, and, and, and Jock has a couple of our assets. I can't even tell you, I think maybe the hog ranch, uh, because that being a uh, Rex minerals and, uh, I don't know where he has gold rock, but maybe railroad. I think he did at 10% discount. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it, it, it's know, interesting, that's... actually. I mean, just, just so if I might bring it to interject here, because the more we look at it, the more interesting it gets to me, the royalty space, I like a royalty. Um, but the way that companies are about, you're, you know, with, with, if you focus on your 12 core or key uh, asset, nice and easy. If you're sitting with having to look at 100 or 200 of these things, it's a little bit harder. And these, they, from what we're seeing, tend to get bundled and valued the same way, same discount applied, whether it's, within two years of production or five years of production or, or, or beyond, which is sort of extraordinary, I, 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 I feel. So um, it's almost like it's, it's easier to kind of bundle everything together and no one's got the time to really look at it. So it will take your word for it. And that, and that, happens, <laughs> well, that happens a lot, it, it seems, in the, wide, in the wider well, it, royalty space. Well, as you say that, you know, I mean, look, if, if so the way, again, thinking that uh, beyond the key assets, which for ours, you can pretty much all put a legitimate production date on given who the operators are, given that they're 
already at, at the mines are already built. And, you know, so even though, I mean, I, uh, I can't tell the analysts what to do, but I think, you know, putting an 8% discount rate on, on, on ours is, is high, but uh, then you get to our development assets. Okay. So here we have 30 some assets. Now, by definition, like I said, these are at or near producing mines. So, you know, with a uh, gold resource now, Fortitude Gold, we have four or five different that are all satellites to their operation. At, with McEwen at Gold Bar, we have all these properties with gold on them that are within their mine operation. And if you go through the list, every one of them is, is you know, probably 50% of our development assets will be a paying royalty. Now, some of those properties might end up only having 50 or 100,000 ounces on them. So, you know, it's, and so what the analysts do with a portfolio like that is they kind of look through the whole thing. They maybe scratch out some back of the envelope stuff. And then they just put a value on that portfolio. Now, our exploration portfolio is a little bit easier because, you know, we have 26 properties, or excuse me now, it's now 30 properties that are in our, uh, option, portfo- or our, our, our option portfolio. These are properties that we have acquired generally through staking, consolidated, sold to third parties, and they're exploring them. Uh, and they purchase them generally, sometimes for cash, but most of our deals are done over a four-year option plan. So we don't do any joint ventures. Uh, we sell the property under an option plan with a down payment and then annual payments over four years that escalate. So kind of similar to a joint venture in that your obligations get higher. Uh, but uh, None with, they don't generally have huge balloons on them, uh, but uh, the, uh, um, it, that portfolio uh, this year will generate uh, just what we have on the books right now, will generate about two and a half million dollars of revenue. Okay, so actually that portfolio, you can put a net asset value on. Now, you might not put a net asset value on it like you would a royalty, but you can put a net asset value on something that's producing two million, two and a half million dollars a year. And that will produce two and a half million next year, uh, almost three or three and a half million in 2023, and then three million in 2024. That's based on what we have on the books right now, keeping in mind that we sell a property about once a month. Uh, So we're always adding to that portfolio. And it, but on the other hand, we also have properties that are rolling off, right? So you have a portfolio where some are maturing and dropping off, especially 2023 is a big year where we have uh, uh, some final payments, but a lot dropping off. And, uh, uh, and, and so 2024 uh, is, is the first year that we see that revenue go down, but, um, uh, but not much. Uh, and then as we add them now, we're kind of keep building and replenishing, if you will, yeah. that cash flow. So no, I, I, I it's it. pretty easy giving that, given that we've been generating that kind of revenue for the last two or three years, and we've got that much on the books. So they can put a net asset value on that which again, for most royalty companies with these large, longer term exploration royalties, you really can't put any value to them uh, because mm-hmm. they're not generating any. I, I get it. And, and, and I, I guess they can, but there's a dose of realism there for them as well, you know, because some of those, some of those um, properties um, may not work out. Some will, new ones will come on, but they, there's a kind of consistency to it because there's a, a real, realism around that. I get it. Um, I mean, we, co- we call it squishy. Squishy, exactly. It's I like squishy. squishy. It's a bit squishy. It's a bit, something it's a falls squishy, off, but... something joins on. It's, it's all good. Yeah. Um, look, so I did, I did want to talk about this before we go because we've been at this a long time and, and, and which I enjoy, which is um, we just in terms of the, coming back to the market thing now, do you think that gold? Is suffering from the cryptocurrency mania at the moment, sixty thousand bucks. 
uh, people have transferred their allegiance to crypto and gold, the shine has gone. Uh, there's a group called uh, 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 Murrenfield, Mir, Mir, is that right? Mir, Murrenfield, uh, uh, that puts out, that does gold research. And uh, they've just put out some very interesting research uh, because, you know, typically you have um, uh, uh, two, two real uh, uh, things that, uh, that drive uh, the price of gold uh, up and down. And the two main ones historically have been uh, the anticipated inflation rate, which is expressed in the, t the tips yield uh, uh, and has been for, for many years now with the tips. And then uh, the, uh, yields, uh, the yield curve, steep, steepness of the yield curve. In other words, you have the inflation rate factors into gold right now. The anticipated inflation rate is not high. And then you have the interest rate, 10-year uh, yield uh, spread, which competes with gold since gold doesn't pay a dividend. Uh, that's been very low and good for gold. Now it's, uh, you know, and now it's, uh, you're, you're seeing that, a spike in that uh, and not seeing a, a, a spike alongside of that in the anticipated inflation rate. So what they've done is a study of what that looked like pre-Bitcoin, okay? And now what it looks like with Bitcoin. And so they're able to actually uh, factor in the Bitcoin now and say, well, if, we, if there was no Bitcoin, it, gold should be this, but it's this. So then, yes, we're seeing, and it's not huge, but... It's very interesting research, and it's it's probably about maybe twenty uh, between ten and twenty percent of the price, depending on the time they they've looked at that they think uh, they're attributing to to Bitcoin, but the rest they can attribute to historically what would have happened with the uh, uh, you know uh, just based on the the other two factors. So. Uh, Yes, I mean, look, uh, you, now we have these fungible trading, uh, to whatever they are. And, and I mean, people buying some crazy stuff. I mean, I like looking at my gold coins. I don't have any out here on the, my desk right now, but uh, generally I do. And during the day, I'm just playing with them, looking at them, you know, maybe doing some, some research on the coins. I, I, you know, it's something... Uh, I, you, you certainly can't do that with Bitcoin. I mean, I put little collections together and, and uh, I have a lot of fun with, with the gold. So it, it's basically a hobby and an investment for me. So uh, uh, it, 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 I, I, I think that over the long term, uh, and, and I think there will be a, a time, and we saw it almost happen here uh, uh, last month with the Reddit uh, investors going after silver. Well, they figured out that they can't really short an ETF or they can't make a run on an ETF, uh, you know, like, like the silver ETF because they can just produce more shares if, uh, if the, uh, if the uh, net asset value gets out of whack and people, you know, JP Morgan can deliver silver or take silver out. Uh, depending on the price. So they really can't do that. But they did run, of course, First Majestic, uh, kind of squeeze the shorts out of that. But uh, I, I think within there, you did start to see some people that, yeah, as I was reading the, uh, the chat in the chat rooms and stuff, uh, people that just kind of fell in love with silver because of it. And now they're buying silver coins and buying other things. I think you'll see that. I think you'll see these these people with these, I mean, all these digital trading baseball cards and, and artwork, and that's all fine for a while. But I mean, in the end, wouldn't you rather just, wouldn't you rather want to have that picture hang on your wall where you can enjoy it and, and those coins uh, in your safe where you can pull them out and say, oh, God, I, I need to add this one to my collection or, um, you know. I, th so. I, think, I think what's clear, Trey, is that it's unclear. I've heard very <laughs> rational arguments from both sides 
of of that discussion. And they both sound extremely plausible, like they always do. Um, but the reality is it feels like no one knows what's going on at the moment. And uh, the, but the good news is there will be someone post the event who was right. Well, look, I mean, I think digital currencies uh, certainly have a place. The whole blockchain thing does make makes a lot more sense to me today than it than it did. Uh, I've never bought anything. I have a real fear. Now, now if you think about in, in, way back in in, in uh, the the Dutch, I always think about the Dutch tulip bulbs and think. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't ever want to admit now at that time, I mean, gold was gold's been trading, you know, for thousands, maybe more tens of thousands of years and uh, has always been a store of value. And, you know, um, sometimes sometimes chicken, sometimes feathers, but um, a lot more chicken than feathers. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I I just I just have this inherent fear of being caught with two bulbs. Uh, I, I, when I think about it in history, I think I wouldn't have wanted to have been the guy who was there <laughs> holding all these tulip bulbs True. when the price crashed. True. So just to fin finish off, what's going to get your price back up and running? Oh, I think we need the price of gold to recover for one thing. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, as, as it recovers, I, I you know, I, I kind of painted a bleak picture in the, in the beginning. Let me Let me just say that. We did here in the last six months, we added 1% to our Lincoln Hill. We added three quarter percent to our hog ranch asset. Uh, we picked up the railroad. Uh, 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 so we, 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 we increased by 50% one of our key assets. Uh, we'll do that all day long. I mean, we love our assets, so we've already done the work on them. If we can add to those positions, we will. Uh, the hog ranch, we increased by 50%. And then we picked up the railroad. So it's not like we've been doing nothing. And we, and we have some other prospects out there. So we'll continue to add things there without diluting. We want them to be accretive to our uh, net asset value, not, uh, not dilutive. And look, our assets are just going to develop. In other words, if, if Jacques got these assets at discounted at 8%, uh, we're going to see some inherent growth just as they get closer and sure and, uh, you know, to, to production. And, you know, we will be doing some site visits out of, of course, a big for us. We were very excited about First Majestic, as I said, getting in and, and really getting uh, improving our asset there. Uh, I mean, that that alone could be would be like us buying another key asset if they if first majestic can get that thing running on even 11 of the 12 cylinders uh, in the meanwhile barrick or new or nevada gold mines at wren uh jerry did a site visit they've now they have now uh drifted in a mile into our property from the underground gold strike mine which oh by the way produced 15 million ounces uh, the high of the whole mine is produced over 50 million ounces. It's the zip, it's the 90210 of, of Nevada. And uh, they've drifted in, they've got three drill rigs turning. Uh, where they drifted into the property at the very beginning was at the end of the Banshee mine, which they're just finishing up. And that mineralization clearly uh, continues under our ground. It had never been drilled before. They're drilling in all directions for, for that. Then they're out drilling over the, uh, the JB zone, which is we know is 2 million ounces. And uh, then they're gonna continue to drift on and, and uh, all the way through the property and over to the underground mine at South Arturo and come out over there uh, or come in from there and, and connect them, whatever. So what's going to happen with three drill rigs turning actually i think there's there's three underground and then they've got a uh some other rigs turning over on uh, on the south uh, east part of the property where they on a new zone they call the uh the sinkhole breccia and so that exploration and development efforts and the you know as that gets closer uh, you know that is uh, that kind of thing will uh, will it really, I think, get get our stock going. Okay. So, 
Do you think you guys could be, well, you <coughs> and the industry be clearer with your uh, cash flow statements, make it easier for people to discern what's happening now, what's going to be happening going forward? We think we did a good job last year of starting to explain that, you know, and a lot of, because some of our revenue comes from, uh, a, a reduction of our cost basis in an asset as opposed to, you know, seeing it as, as on the top revenue line. Uh, but I think for us, that's another thing you will see this year uh, when you ask about uh, uh, what could help our stock price is we are really uh, budgeted and focused on profitability this year. So you will see that. Uh, and you'll also see us, I think, uh, working we, we're putting out our annual information form. We're putting out a, a prospectus uh, and uh, a short form prospectus and uh, working towards a, a NYSE listing. So uh, we think that, and that's what it would take for us to be included as we grow in uh, into the indexes. Okay, you can, you're gonna need to obviously hit a few different targets to kind of get on the NYSE, aren't you, in terms of market cap, share price, et cetera. So can we expect to see some restructuring there? Well, it says that stock price, of course, if we did that, we'd have to do a, a reverse split to get the stock price up. But as far as a assets and market cap and that, uh, we, you know, we pretty much would qualify today. Uh, might need, a, a, again, a little bit. Of, we'd like to see a little bit of help from the market. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we're not in a hurry to do that. Uh, like I said, it's not like it's a, it, it's a goal throughout this year, but I'll say that that goal is, is based on, uh, you know, having, getting, getting some help from the market. In other words, we, don't, we, 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 we would rather, you know, have less of a reverse with the stock price higher. Uh, and we could, you could also see our stock price just as as investors during this rougher time here, they really start to drill down and look at our competitors that are trading, you know, and some of them are $100 million market cap companies, some are our, our, our much larger companies, but trading, you know, some are trading at a big premium to us, some are trading at a similar net asset value to us, but with not near the quality of assets that we have. So we think we think we're due a re-rating. Uh, we think we should be trading certainly over what with our assets over one times uh, NAV. And as uh, you hear see Fenelon 70,000 meters of drill results in a in a maiden resource and you see uh, results from uh, Nevada gold mines at, at REM. Uh, and you see at Marigold SSR Mining putting out results uh, on on our property there, expanding what you know it, it look, is looking like going to be one of the key development areas for them starting next year. Uh, then I think that re-rating will come. I mean, I think our stock could go up 50% just to be rated, just just for our assets to be valued where the our competitors are. Okay, Trey. Let's wrap it up there. Thanks for the right. uh, update. Appreciate it. Stay in touch. Let us know uh, how things progress, okay? Okay. Thanks now.